happy Sabbath, church. So today, as you guys know, based off the title of the sermon and by the slideshow, I will be talking about discipleship. But um, before I get into that, I would like to have a quick word of prayer. So maybe we all please close our eyes. God, um, thank you again for just the Sabbath day. Thank you for allowing us this day of rest to not worry about the things of the week and the things of the world and just really be in commune with you. Um, please speak through me today. Please fill me with the Holy Spirit. And please help that I can touch someone, even if it's just one person today in the congregation, and they can leave differently than how they came. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay. So to begin, when I want to define what discipleship is. Um, a lot of times when you think of discipleship, people think about deacons or deaconesses or stewards. And that's all right, of course. But I want to think about the actual definition of it. Okay, there we go. According to the SDA Disciple, Discipleship Handbook, discipleship is the process of becoming like Jesus by spending time with Jesus. And based off of our titles, which is a Christian, we are followers of Christ. You know, by the definition of discipleship by the world, it's, a, it's to be a student or a follower of someone. So we, as Christians, are followers of Jesus. And we do this by spending time with him, by reading the word, by praying with him, and by following his example. And so because of that, I want to look at exactly how Jesus grew up, how he acted when he was a child. Sorry. According to Matthew verses 4, verses 19, it says, Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fisher of men. This means before we go out into the world and we spread the gospel, we first need to follow him. I think a lot of times we try to skip the first part and we just do the second one and we just go out there, which is a great thing to do, of course, but we need to know who we're following. We need to understand who we're a student of, whose philosophy we're following. And we do that by first following Jesus. So now we can look at him when he was younger. So in Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 52, basically Joseph, Mary, and um, Jesus went back to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when they were there, they, you know, did everything that they were supposed to, and eventually Joseph and Mary left to go back to their hometown. And after a few days of traveling, they discovered that Jesus wasn't with them. So now they started frantically looking around, trying to figure out where Jesus is. They end up going back to Jerusalem to look for Jesus, and lo and behold, where they found him was in the temple, right? And so Mary is just like, Jesus, where have you been? Why are you here? And Jesus responds to them as, and he says, I need to be in my father's house. Jesus, of course, since Jesus is Jesus Christ, we wouldn't see him as a disciple of Christ, but rather as a disciple of God. And because of that, he knew in his heart that he had to be in the temple of God. He had to be with God. He had to have this spiritual strength. And because of that, we know that we need to have this as well. We need to be close with Christ, and to be close with Christ means we have to be close to God. That's how we follow God. And at a very young age, Jesus had to make the decision himself to be a disciple, you know? He could have done anything at this time, but he knew in his heart that he had to be in the house of his father. He had to be intentional. I think oftentimes as youth, we kind of, we feel like we're a Christian by extension of our parents, but that's not really how that works. As a Christian, we are, we're a student of God, right? We're a student of Christ. It's a crazy thing to think that because our parents are students, we're a student too. That's not how being a student works. Being a student means that you personally study the Bible, you personally follow what he says, you know? According, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it reads, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. I think a lot of times as youth, we kind of minimize ourselves and think that we'll leave, I guess, the work of the gospel to our parents. We'll let our parents read the Bible. We'll let our parents talk amongst the church. We'll let our parents 
truly have a relationship with Christ and we'll worry about that when we're older. But the fact of the matter is that I think a lot of us are ready for the spiritual food, yet we keep on taking in this milk. When we're not babies in Christ, we can keep growing up and we have to make that choice for ourselves because no one can make it for us. You know, Jesus, when he was a young boy, he had to make that decision, which means we have to make that decision as well. So another example I have is of young David. And a lot of times David is someone who is used to prove to us that we are not too young. And I'm sure many of us growing up in the church have heard this before. You know, you're not too young to work for God. We're not too young to work for Christ. But I want to talk about why we're not too young. In 1 Samuel 16, the entire chapter, it is basically of God speaking to the prophet Samuel and telling Samuel that King Saul is no longer listening to what God is telling him to do and now they need a new king. So he goes, Samuel, goes to the house of Jesse trying to look for who will replace the new king. He looks at all the sons and as he's looking at them, he's like, no, it's not you, it's not you, it's not you. So he turns to Jesse and he asks, is this all, are these all the sons that you have? Is there anyone else? And Jesse responds to him, yes, I have one more son. He's in the field. They go out to the field, and David was there. And immediately when he saw David, he was like, yes, you will be the next, you will be the next king. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. I think this verse is very important because it says the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. That shows us that we personally need to have the spirit if we want to be a disciple. God knew that David wouldn't be able to deal with all of the battles that he was going to eventually face without the spirit of the Lord. He needed that spiritual strength. He needed that spiritual strength that Jesus had. And we need that spiritual strength if we're going to decide to be to be a disciple, you know? I think that the reason we're not too young to be a leader for God is because there are no age restrictions to have the Holy Bible, well, to have the Holy Spirit, you know? We have to, when we make this um, decision to be a disciple, when we make this decision to read the Bible, when we make this decision to pray to God and have this relationship with him, we're basically allowing the spirit to come into our lives and to fill us up so we can go out and do God's work. So now that we've talked about what being a disciple is, I would like to discuss the importance of obedience, right? And we all need to understand that to be a disciple of God, we have to discover that we are bigger than ourselves. You know, there is a war going on that we can't see. And quite frankly, sometimes it's really easy to forget, you know, but we are part of this war. And if we don't choose a side, it will be chosen for us. We have a fleshly desire, which means that if we're left alone to just do whatever we want, we're going to sin because of just because of our flesh. So we have to make this choice every single day to basically to follow God, you know? And a part of that is being obedient, as he calls us to be. In Luke 5, basically Simon and three other fishermen had been out all night trying to catch fish, right? And nothing was coming. Then they eventually, they just felt, they felt hopeless and they were just going to give up. But Jesus saw Simon, and Jesus asked Simon if he could go into his boat, and Simon said yes. Then Simon, then Jesus preached to the people, and after he was finally done preaching to them, he went to Simon, and he told him, put your net into the, put your net into the water. And Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night, but we have caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And The most important part here is the part where it says, nevertheless, at your word, I will. That's what we have to say to ourselves every single day. As disciples of Christ, we have to to follow what Christ wants us to do, and we have to follow what God wants us to do. We don't see the bigger picture that God sees, you know? We don't see the bigger picture of this war, but he knows everything, and he is intentional with every single thing that he tells us, which is why we have to listen. I want us to try to look at this story beyond like the literal sense of it. I want to think of it kind of like as a metaphor, right? So I want you to imagine rather than the fish that Simon had been trying to catch all night being actual fish, 
imagine it was people. And this story quickly becomes a story about, about discipleship and spreading the gospel in general, you know? We can try to spread the gospel to that one friend, but it seems like nothing we're saying is really helping them, nothing we're saying is really hitting home with them, and at some point, we just want to give up, you know, not ask them to church anymore, not maybe pray for them, stuff like that. But the fact of the matter is we have to keep going, you know? Perhaps a hundred times, nothing happened, but maybe that one extra time, finally, that seed is going to be planted, and God will be able to work with them. That's why we have to tell ourselves, nevertheless, at your word, I will. And I think, I think we might be wondering, what is God's word, you know? Okay, fine, let's say we think that we will, right? We're ready to do it. But our question is, how do, how do we know his word? How do we know? It's the Bible. The Bible is his word. We have it. His word is to follow Jesus and be fisher of men. His word is to pick up our cross and follow Jesus. His word is to spread the three angels' message. That is his word, and he never put any time restriction on it. He never said, oh, follow me one day every week, and then like for the rest of it, just give up. It's whatever. He didn't say, only follow him and spread the gospel to that one friend, but nobody else. He didn't say, do it for a year, and then you're good. Like, you're fine. It'll be whatever. No, he says to keep doing it. That means even when it feels hopeless, we have to keep going. That is his word, so we will do it. Additionally, we may ask ourselves how we can hear God's voice, you know, beyond just reading the Bible, even though that is extremely important. And I think there's this misconception that his voice is going to come to us in a dream or through a fiery bush. But the fact of the matter is, a lot of times, his voice is very, very quiet. It's that quiet voice in, like, the back of our minds that tells us, hey, go give, go feed that person that you see hey, go give that brother or sister a text, see how they're doing. That's his voice, but we ignore it because our head is so full of other things. When we have that little thought telling us to go pray for someone, we're also thinking about, oh, but I have to go pick up the kids. Oh, I have to go make dinner. Oh, I need to go catch like the latest football game. I don't know. And because of that, we end up ignoring that voice that we hear because we have a million other things on, that, on our minds. And so that means our job as a disciple, the more that we read the Bible, the more that we pray with God, the better we'll get at hearing this voice. The more that we're filled with the Holy Spirit, the more we'll be able to distinguish when God is talking to us. We'll be more sensitive to things that are holy and spiritual, and we will recognize his voice in our minds. And I need us to all understand that it it all fits together. You know, we all know the Trinity of Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit. And so us as disciples, we need to follow Jesus, right? By following Jesus, that means we have to be in communion with God. And being in communion with God will give us the Holy Spirit. It all comes together. Once we follow one path, we're gonna, everything else is basically gonna fall into place perfectly. And now that, you know, I've discussed the importance of obedience and what discipleship is, I understand that sometimes it can be easy to, I guess, be scared and to feel discouraged because Jesus was perfect and it's really easy to think like, oh, I could never be like that. I could never be perfect. And you don't even want to try anymore. But we have to understand that that right there is a trap from the devil and we just can't listen to it. You know, the devil doesn't want God's message to be shared. So because of that, he's going to try to instill this fear and this worthlessness in us so we can then, um, so then we'll stop before we even tried. You know, that's his plan. If he can get no disciples out there, he'll feel really great about himself. About himself. We need to understand that the war is already won, so our job as disciples is tr to try to save as many people as we can, you know? And of course, like, we can't save them ourselves. That's God's job. But our job is to put those seeds there, you know, to let him use us so we can go help others. I will need us all to keep in mind that no disciple was or is perfect. All of them, and I promise you, all of them had their faults, you know? You can go find that in the Bible. The, the fact of the matter is it's just that we, we just need to try. We need to start somewhere. God will take us as we are, and he will mold us along the way. We just basically need to have this desire to start and this willingness 
to accept Jesus as we're going on this journey of discipleship. And so the example, the main disciple that I would like to really focus on when it comes to this would be Peter. Um, Peter is someone who is known as someone who can be kind of reckless or impulsive, maybe a little loudmouth in the Bible. But yet, towards the end of his life, he was a great disciple for God. And I would kind of want to show how he was really able to make that transition. So in Matthew 14, that's the famous chapter where Jesus walks on water. And the disciples were in this boat, and it was misty outside, and they see someone walking towards them. And immediately, they're all scared. They're like, is it a ghost? What's happening? They're all fearful. And Jesus says, it's me. It's me. It's the Lord. Like, you're good. And Peter answered and said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. This is important because it shows Peter's willingness to be open. It shows his desire to, like, be with the Lord. You know, that is basically him welcoming and inviting the Lord to work miracles in his life. A lot of time, a lot of times I think we kind of, we want God to do all of this special stuff in our lives. We want him to work all these miracles, but we never really invite him into our life. You know, we want him to change our life magnific magnificently, but like, we don't, we're not in the Bible. We don't ask, we don't ask him like, God, please help us. We don't ask him to fill us with the Holy Spirit. But that is a very important part of being a disciple. We have to invite God into our lives because God isn't going to force himself on us, you know? So we have to let, we have to show him our willingness to let him work in our lives. And as soon as Peter said, like, Lord, if it's you, like, command me to walk on this water, Peter did. Peter got outside of the boat and he was able to walk. Jesus was able to work this miracle, which was a testimony not only to Peter, but to all the disciples on that boat. And I mean, it's even a, tes a testimony to us today, you know? He was able to do his work and he was able to spread the gospel through this one situation, all because Peter was willing. Peter asked him to work a miracle in his life. The only problem in this situation was that once the wind started to get shaky and Peter got, like, Peter got scared, he started to sink because he took his eyes off of Jesus. This shows that for us, when we start to have battles in our own lives, we, we get nervous and we get scared and we start to lose this willingness in our life. You know, we no longer have this desire. Maybe we're angry at God, maybe we're sad at God, and we just, we want him to leave us alone. And that's when we start to sink. That's when this relationship we have with God begins to fail, once we start losing this desire. But the good thing, and lucky for us, is that God is extremely merciful, and he's willing to give us a second chance, which can be found here. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Sometimes, it's true, we doubt, you know? We, we lose this willingness, but God is still there to help pick us up. He's still there to have his hand outstretched when we are ready to come back. The thing is, we have to grab that hand, you know? If we don't want the help, God isn't going to, like, pick us up and throw us and force us to follow his will. He's going to have his hand out, and it's up to us to take it. It's up to us to continue to make that intentional choice to be a disciple. And then, as I said before, Peter is known as someone who is a bit reckless and let's just say impulsive, right? I have two examples of that. The one is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And basically what happened here is it was the night of Jesus' arrest and he brought the disciples into this garden and he asked to pray with them. All the disciples ended up falling asleep, but as soon as the soldiers came to take Jesus, let's just say Peter was ready for violence, right? He took out his knife and he cut off one of the soldiers' ears, right? And this is something that we as Christians are not supposed to do. We know we're not supposed to be violent. We know we're not supposed to, you know, I guess, like, have this backlash that he had. You know, that's not what Jesus did. Jesus peacefully went with them. And so we might ask ourselves, like, that does not seem like someone God would want to be a disciple for him. That doesn't seem like that's a good role model for us. Another example is when it was at the Last Supper. 
when Jesus told Peter that he was going to deny him three times. Peter said multiple times, he's like, no, I'm not going to deny you. I would die for you. I would go to prison with you. He, was, he had a lot of talk, right? He was like, I won't do it, I won't. But then when the, t- when the time came and Jesus was actually being crucified, he did deny him three times, just like Jesus said, you know? So looking at that, you might be a little shocked. We're like, that's the disciple? That's the person who went out into the world and spread the gospel? Like, that's who God wanted? And the fact of the matter is, yes, that is who God wanted. Because after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he turned out to be just a a great disciple, you know? He was able to grow in his spiritual strength during that time, during the time of that resurrection when the Holy Spirit was, you know, poured onto the people at that time. He was able to grow and learn and become a great disciple. He was able to grow in that spiritual strength, which is how God was able to mold him over time. He wasn't just born and immediately perfect, you know? I mean, even towards the end, he wasn't perfect, but God was able to work with him over time. As long as we all start somewhere, you know, God will be able to help us. I think a lot of times we kind of fall into this trap of like, comparing ourselves at the beginning of our journey to someone who's towards the end of theirs, you know? We compare ourselves to these disciples towards the end of their journey, and we, we just can't do that, you know? It's kind of like these thoughts that the devil is trying to put into, is trying to put into like our heads to get us to stop trying. Another problem is that we want to be wise, which is of course a good thing, but we, We expect wisdom to just be a talent, which it is, but it's also a skill, which means it can be developed over time, you know? Um, I think we know, we all know the story of like King Solomon, and we expect wisdom to work like that in our own lives. We expect that overnight, like with the snap of our fingers, we're going to be the wisest person on earth, but that's just not how it works. Over time, as Jesus is working with us, as we're being a disciple, we will slowly grow wiser and wiser with him. But that means we have to start somewhere. We can't grow wise if we just sit down all day in the congregation and not willing to go out and like go talk to people if we're not willing to take on these leadership roles. I have a personal experience actually, as some of you may know, I am a teacher of one of the Sabbath school classes. And at first, I was extremely scared. And in my mind, I was thinking, God, is this what you want me to do? Are you sure I'm the person for this? Like, I feel like there are a lot of other people who could do better, who can explain it better. And I mean, at first, it was difficult being a teacher, you know? These kids have questions for me, and I don't know exactly how to answer them. I wonder sometimes if I'm really, like, making sense to them, if I'm asking the right questions. And there were times I was like, I don't know if I'm actually helping. Like, I don't know if I should do this. But what I realized eventually was I have to start somewhere, you know? Sure, right now, I'm not perfect by all means. I'm not the best teacher, but I'm trying. And I know that God will continue to make me a better teacher and I will get better over time. I will be better at sharing these stories. I will be better at explaining these things to these kids. And I can admit, I do think I'm getting better over time. And I know you all can too, but that means you have to start. That means you have to take on these roles. At first, you might feel uncomfortable and you might feel weird, but it's all part of the process and it's all a part of growing wiser in Christ. An example that I really want to use is the example of young Samuel from 1 Samuel chapter 3. And this is all about wisdom mainly. Basically, what happened here is Sam, yeah, Samuel was living with the prophet Eli. And in the middle of the night, Samuel hears his voice, Samuel, Samuel. So he wakes up, he runs to Eli, and he's like, yes, like, what do you need? And Eli's like, I didn't call you. And he's like, okay. Samuel thinks that's weird, but he goes back to bed. Then he goes back to sleep, he hears the voice again, Samuel, Samuel. He runs right back to Eli, and he's like, yes, what do you need, what do you need? Eli's like, I didn't call you, go back to bed. After a few rounds of this, Eli eventually tells him, like, okay, Next time you hear this voice, respond to it, because it might be God speaking to you. So the next time he hears it, and he goes, Samuel, Samuel, Samuel answers and says, speak, for your servant hears you. I think what's super important here is that Samuel didn't have all the answers for himself. He had to rely on someone who was wiser than him. 
I don't know about you guys, but I know personally, if I heard my heard someone calling me, I would just assume it was like from my parents or something. I would have never thought to say, yes, God, like I'm here, like I'm listening, you know? I would have probably just tried to go back to bed because he just didn't have that wisdom that Eli had, you know? Samuel was going to go on to be a great prophet, but he had to start somewhere, you know? He wasn't born knowing everything. He wasn't born being this amazing prophet that he grows up to be. He had to start somewhere and he had to rely on the wisdom of his elders. And I think we have to do the same, you know? We have to listen to the people before us because they've had these experiences that we don't have. There are things that God has revealed to him that he will reveal to us in time as well, but we just have to listen and trust them for now. An additional part of this, I think it all goes back to the willingness to be a disciple. Here we see, Sam, the, we see God calling Samuel, right? And God could have kept talking, but he didn't. He wanted Samuel to say, speak for your servant hears. He wanted to know that Samuel had that willingness, had that desire to, to hear him, you know? He didn't, he didn't just continue to speak because he didn't want to force himself on Samuel. Samuel had to have that desire within himself. On top of that, God wanted this to be um, a learning experience for Samuel, you know? Samuel would have never learned the lesson of responding when he hears his name, when God is talking to him, without this story. And so maybe at first Samuel felt a little awkward. Samuel felt like this was a weird or uncomfortable situation to be in. But God was able to teach him a lesson through this regardless. So now that we've discussed what discipleship is and the importance of obedience and the importance of starting somewhere, I want to talk about different forms of discipleship. A lot of times I think we as Christians think the only type of discipleship there is is um, going out, going out door to door and talking to the person on the road. And while that is an extremely valid form of spreading the gospel, it's not the only one. There are a bunch of other forms that are extremely helpful and necessary. The first example, I, the first form of discipleship I'd like to talk about is discipling within the church. We think that people, people within the congregation never doubt and they're always super strong with God, but that's just not what happens. You know, everyone has their moments. Everyone ha falls on hard times. And so because of that, God can speak to them through us. We have to allow him to use us as a vessel. One of the ways of doing that is taking on leadership roles. And since this is specifically to the youth, I would like to say one of these leadership roles is by participating in AY, you know, coming onto the team. We make, um, we actually like make the AYs ourselves, you know? And if we pray before we make the AYs and we let the Holy Spirit use us, we never know who we might be talking to. So I recommend that you guys come and participate at AYs and you're a part of the AY team that you guys um, come and make some AYs yourself because that is a completely valid form of being a disciple. The next way that we can be a disciple is by sharing testimonies. Testimonies is a great way to inspire people and we need to understand that there's nothing too small to share. Because I know I've definitely fell into that trap sometimes where I might feel like God is telling me like, go share this, go share this. But I'm like, no, like no one wants to hear about that. Like that's barely anything, you know? But that's not true. There is no testimony too small. I mean, the fact that we're living is a testimony in and of itself. You know, the fact that we're healthy is a testimony. And that might be the story that other people need to hear. People who, are, who have fell on hard times might need to hear that testimony that you that God has inspired you to share. So I just would like to say, tell it, you know? When we have these opportunities, go and say it. Go talk to your brothers and your sisters and tell them the testimony and what God has done for you. And then another way to be a disciple within the church is just by being a good example. I think this is definitely one of the most important ways to be a disciple because it's the way we share God's character. And I mean, we, we should be a good example because it encourages other people to want to hold themselves to high standards as well. When you surround yourself with people who follow the Bible and who do these things that God wants them to do, you feel inspired and you're like, oh, I should act like them. I should go come to AY. I should read my Sabbath school lesson book. I should do all of this sort of thing, do all this sort of stuff. And so us as disciples, we should be who other people want to like 
want to be around, you know? That's a part of our discipleship. The next way we can be a disciple is with friends. Doing this, we can invite them to church, we can invite them to programs like AY, the Friday Night Bible Studies, Pathfinders and Adventurers, and being a disciple with friends and spreading the gospel with friends is actually a very special way to be a disciple because we already have a pre-established relationship with them. A lot of times when we go out and we try to spread the word, people can feel upset because they're like, who is this stranger talking to me? Why are they trying to sell me something? What do they want from me? You know, like when we ring on like their doorbell, they're like, oh, like who is this now, right? But when we have a relationship with our friends, they know that we only want what's best for them, you know? They don't feel as defensive. They know we're not trying to sell anything. We know we're not trying to annoy them. We just want them to be happy and have the joy that Christ can give them. And it's important that when we do this, we're not going in with this with the intention of like converting them because that's not our job, you know? We don't do this so like they can eventually say they're an SDA. We do this so they can have a relationship with God. And that means our job is just to plant the seed so God can actually work with them and work with their heart. As long as we talk to them and we plant that seed, God will do the rest. And then lastly, another way we can be a disciple is by actually going out and doing what Jesus did. Jesus, um, on the Sabbath, he would often perform many miracles, which means us, as followers of Christ, we need to do the same. We should be going out during the Sabbath. And of course, not even when it's not the Sabbath, we should be going out during the entire week, you know, and talking to people and getting to know these people in our community. In Mark 2, verse 17, Jesus said, Those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Sometimes we get stuck in the cycle of just coming to church, going home, going through the week, and doing it all over again, you know? But when we do that, we end up not reaching people outside of the church. We only talk to the people who already know about God, who already know about Christ. But what about those people who don't have any relationship with Christ, who might not even know about the Bible? Sometimes that might be like a weird thing to think of, that there are people out there who don't know about God, but the fact of the matter is, is there are. There are people who truly don't have anyone in their life to share Jesus with them. And so we have a job as Christians to do that, and we do that by going out into the community and reaching people who just have no other connection to Christ. And now I need to talk about the importance of being bold, you know? So I've already talked about the different forms of being a disciple, but regardless of whether you decide to do it in church or by going door to door or talking to friends, no matter what, we need to be bold in it. Because people aren't going to like it, okay? That's just the fact of the matter. Like There are people who aren't going to like to hear what we have to say. This is definitely going to deviate from the norm, but we have to do it anyways because it's what we're called to do. We can't be worried about what others have to say. We can't base our actions based on the reactions of others. We have to, we just have to be bold. It's what we're called to do. And I need us, I want us to think about this as like going against the grain, you know, being outside of like these social norms. And all of these examples that I've already provided, like Jesus when he was young and young David and Peter and stuff like that, Every single one of them, at some point in their life, did go against the grain. For example, Jesus at the age of 12, he was found talking and in, talking with the other teachers, right? And us as young people, that can be extremely scary, you know? Like, you want me to go talk to the adults? Like, I have to go talk to them about the Bible? Like, I should go ask them this question? Like, no way. Like, I'm not doing that, you know? But we have to be bold in our faith, and we have to do it anyways, you know? Because, I mean, they're here to help us. They, they want us to grow in our relationship with Christ. They want us to be disciples. So yes, it might be scary, but we can't let fear run our lives. We have to go and talk to them anyways. We have to really engage with the Bible. We have to go against the grain. And then David was, at this time, he went. And then lastly would be Peter. Um, Peter, towards the end of his life, he was persecuted and eventually executed for his beliefs. Um, and we have to understand, as I said before, that people aren't going to like what we have to say. 
And sometimes people being angry or people being upset might sometimes be an indicator that what we're saying is right, what we're saying is true. As long as like we're following what the Bible says and we're not adding our own things into it, people might get upset. Because we have to understand that the devil doesn't want us to talk. The devil doesn't want to hear anything that we have to say. And so once we start spreading the gospel, He's going to do everything and anything he can to get us to stop. He's going to try and get people to yell at us. He's going to try to get us to lose friends. He's going to try to scare us out of sharing the gospel. But we can't let that fear run our lives. We can't give in to this peer pressure. In John 15, verse 18, Jesus says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated hated me before it hated you. Basically, what Jesus is saying here is that when you go out into the world and you're spreading the gospel and people are mad at you and people hate what you have to hate what you have to hear don't let that stop you because just as it hates us now they hated him before in that time so we can't like we can't let these outside opinions fact like impact what we do now and i want us to understand that like at some point we are going to be held accountable for what we do today, right? And when God comes to us and he asks us if we if we fed him when he was hungry, if we gave him a drink when he was thirsty, if we took him in when he was a stranger, if we clothed him if he was naked, if we visited him if he was sick, and if we came to him when he was in prison, don't let our answer be no because we were scared. Can you can you imagine if God asked us like where were you when I was hungry? Oh, I was kind of too scared to come. Are you kidding me? That, that's embarrassing to say we didn't out of fear. Like, we can't let something as small as fear, which is just in our own heads, we can't let something as small as that stop us. We have to be bold, and we have to know that God is with us, and God is helping us, and we have to do it anyways. Um, in Matthew 19, verse 14, Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. There are many reasons as to why Jesus would have said something like that. But I think one of these reasons is because a lot of times as we grow up, we become very pessimistic and kind of stubborn, you know? And we don't want to change anything. We don't want to be the change within the church. A lot of times um, the youth leave the church because they say, I don't like the hypocrisy I see. I don't like how the adults act. I don't like what I'm seeing within the church. But if that's the reason you're leaving, like, how is anything going to change? We have to be the ones to fix it. We have to be the bold ones within our church, within the congregation, to be a true disciple. We have to be the one to follow what Jesus wants us to do. And so this is all a part of kind of like going against the grain because children, oftentimes, they don't care what other people have to say about them, you know? They do... They do what they think is right, and they do what they think is necessary. That's how we need to be. We need to be young in heart, but mature in our spirit and mature in our relationship with God. So as my final remarks to everyone, I have first a message to the youth. I would like to call you guys all to be more involved in the church and just to grow spiritually. As I said before, this means being involved in AY, you know, coming up here, maybe doing a sermon yourself one day, maybe um, just when, when people call you and ask you to do scripture reading, when they ask you to do a prayer, say yes, you know, and I mean, it'll be a learning experience for you, and at first, it might feel weird, it might feel awkward and uncomfortable, but this is all a part of God helping you and molding you to be a disciple and to grow spiritually. Then to the adults, I would like to ask you all to encourage us by participating yourselves. I think sometimes you underestimate how much of an effect you guys have on us, but we watch everything that you guys do, you know? It's it's part of this hypocrisy that I was talking about. When we hear you guys come up here and talk about spreading the gospel and talking about, you know, being a disciple of Christ, but then we never see you guys do it yourselves, We don't want to do it anymore, and we just stay home, and we're not really learning and growing in our relationship. So I would like to ask you all to show up to AY, to also say yes when people ask you to be up here. And then to the parents, I would like to ask you all to just encourage us with your words. Keep us on, like, the straight path and keep us, like, on the straight and narrow path. 
basically like when someone asks us to do something, kind of give us a little nudge and be like, yeah, like you should do it, like go say yes, you know? And I think that we also need you guys to be here to discipline us. As much as we might not like it sometimes, it's definitely necessary. To be a disciple, we can't be lazy, you know? Like there, there's no room for laziness as a disciple. So we need to make sure that you guys are bringing us up in the right way. And so I guess all together, what I would like for everyone is to just keep us these help that I did reach someone. Please help um, us as the youth to grow spiritually and to be bold and to start somewhere and to not be scared or let fear like run our lives, but for us to speak your word and speak your truth and to obey everything that you want us to do. Please, I would just like to pray for all of us as we're learning to be disciples and as we're on this journey. Please keep working with us. Please keep forgiving us as we, you know, fall short. In the name of Jesus, amen.